know and love with all this dazzling diversity. To find out, we're putting these dogs through their paces. We'll investigate how the breeds compare and reveal what makes each one unique. We'll find out what makes the Greyhound the fastest breed of all. From coming out of the trap up to the first bend, they're reaching nearly 40 miles per hour. Reveal what makes these dogs such good swimmers. Oh, yes, you can really see that pulsing through the water. Uncover why some dogs are so hairy and others hairless. The origin of the hairless dog may have been just to make them a bit more oven ready. And historian Ruth Goodman will unearth the extraordinary stories behind some of the world's most iconic breeds. This is one of your ancestors, look. She's not interested in family history, I don't think. We're celebrating the dog in all its spectacular and unlikely forms. Welcome to the wonder of dogs. Well, in Oxfordshire, we're carrying out a unique investigation into man's best friend. We've invited all the local dogs. We've got Labradors, Labradoodles, Pugs, Chihuahuas, Mastiffs, Collies, Spaniels, plus some very special guests, like this wonderful Commodore behind me. And down here, I've got my three very excited dogs. This is Teg and Badger and Bella. In our big marquee over there, we're conducting a census of the village dogs. Recording their every feature, from the pads on their paws to the colour of their coats. In our anatomy tent, we're going to explore that ingenious physiology hidden under all that fur. And in here, we're delving into doggy DNA. We want to find out if there's something unique inside every domestic dog that allows them to come in so many shapes and sizes and to reveal the surprising pedigrees of some of Brightwell's dogs. Throughout the show, we'll be uncovering how such extreme differences between dogs came about. Our first question, why are some dogs so much bigger than others? What's really obvious watching these dogs racing back and forth is the sheer variety in size. And that's not surprising because domestic dogs display the biggest size range of any terrestrial mammal, living or extinct. Dogs vary from 10 centimetres high to more than a metre. In human terms, that's the equivalent of having a person a metre tall alongside a 10 metre giant. I'd like you to meet Boris here, who is one of the extreme ends of the dogs in the village in terms of size. Look at him, he's enormous. He's a mastiff. And to give you a sense of the other end of the scale, I'm going to show you Dudley. Now, these two know each other. In fact, they are friends. They met at the local vet surgery, and the receptionist there thought it was so bizarre that they played together. She took a photo, and actually it made it onto the front of the local paper. I've got Boris's owner, Chris, here. Hello. Now, what made you pick Boris? I take it you thought long and hard about letting a dinosaur into your house? <laughs> well, we've had Mastiffs before, so we kind of knew what we were in for. And um, apart from the fact that he takes up a whole settee to himself in the evening when we sit down and watch the telly, um, it's just like having any other dog, really, just bigger. But, Helen, you wanted something very different. What made you pick Dudley? Because he is absolutely tiny. Uh, we sat for a neighbour's puppy 
to our puppy and they're just such huge characters that we decided to get one. Well, hopefully we can get some lovely photos taken. I think the most incredible aspect of both of these dogs is they are, believe it or not, the same species. If you want to see how that is possible, you have to get it under the skin and take a look at the bones, which we have over here. Now this is a chihuahua skeleton, and look how tiny that is, especially when you put it next to a bigger dog. Now, unfortunately, this isn't a massive, this is a greyhound. And if you look at them, they do look wildly different. But when you focus in on the bones, there aren't any more in the greyhound. They're just a different size and shape, resulting in two completely different looking animals. All dogs have 301 bones in their bodies. It's just the additional number of tail bones that varies. Now, Archaeologists have found bones of big and small dogs in ancient human settlements, highlighting the fact that we've been living with dogs of varying sizes across hundreds and thousands of years. And this is reflected well in the village today, from 100 kilos of Boris at one end, all the way down to Dudley here, who weighs less than a kilo. Now, you may think that the Chihuahua is a recent invention, bred purely for fashion, but they've got a surprisingly long and intriguing history. Ruth Goodman is at the British Museum to uncover the big story behind the world's smallest breed. As an historian and a dog lover, I've always been fascinated by the way that people and dogs seem to have evolved together. In fact, if you start looking at that relationship throughout history, what you're really studying is us. I've come to see how Rhea, as a chihuahua, is absolutely a perfect example of this relationship. Scientists have found a DNA connection between modern chihuahuas and ancient Mexican dogs that lived a thousand years ago. Dr. Elizabeth Bacadano has seen these small dogs depicted by several lost civilizations. Dogs were really essential companions of the Mexicans. The Aztecs represented them, the Toltecs, the Mayas, the Mixtecs. This lady, she's got a little tiny dog holding it just like I am. I have to say, it brings to mind Paris Hilton and handbags. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a more serious side to dogs in society. Absolutely. When somebody died, dogs were placed in burials. They were placed together with the deceased. They helped the deceased make the journey of afterlife. It seems that ancient Mexicans believed that if they were buried with their dogs, they'd have a spiritual companion in the afterlife. What intrigues me is why they're so small. They're all so tiny, aren't they? Absolutely. Mexican dogs were always small, a bit like this chihuahua. Yeah. But why? We don't know exactly. But it could be that smaller dogs were useful hunters in dense jungle, or that they were simply easier to fatten up for eating. What's most likely is that one unusually small dog appeared in a litter of puppies, and the ancient Mexicans liked it so much, they bred thousands from that one line. But when the Spanish invaded Mexico, it seemed the miniature Mexican breed's days were numbered. Big dogs, fighting dogs, were introduced by the Spaniards in the 16th century. That must have been quite a, a shock, really. I mean, if, if the only dogs you'd ever known were tiny little things that you could carry on your shoulder, you get this huge, great mastiff with big jaws and big teeth. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, you know, the Mexicans, the Mesoamerican people, weren't aware that dogs like this ever existed. It was very frightening to see dogs fighting, killing people. Don't worry. You're much more cute than a mastiff. You are. <laughs> But the small Mexican dog survived. In the late 19th century, Americans visiting North Mexico spotted this tiny native breed and named it after the region where it was found, Chihuahua. Within decades, this miniature pooch became a fashion accessory and a true global icon. Poop, 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 poop
The Chihuahua's baby face may have allowed it to conquer the world, but most of the small dogs here in Brightwell were bred to work for a living. To find out more about these feisty little dogs, I'm meeting local dog trainer Jenny Fairweather. Tell me about what's going on here this afternoon. Well, we've got an agility course, which would be a typical one at any competition. So this is, we've got this little dog, wow, going like a, ro <laughs> a rocket behind us here. What is the advantage of having a small dog? Why were these small breeds developed? Most of these were vermin exterminators. Right, so um, they wanted dogs that could get into little spaces and be quick and agile on their feet. Yeah, and be able to turn in a space, so if they went down a fox's burrow, they need to be able to turn on themselves to be able to escape if they decided the fox was too vicious, or the badger. The perfect example of an underground hunting breed is the Dachshund, which means badger dog in German. Their short legs and spade-like paws make them perfectly adapted to burrowing into tunnels. And it's thought that sturdy tail helped hunters pull them out if they got into a tight spot with a badger. As we bred for small, nimble dogs, we were selecting for genes with big impact. Amazingly, just one gene is responsible for short legs. And a dog's body size is largely down to another single gene. In a human, these features are influenced by hundreds of genes. But when you look at these little dogs scurrying over the agility course, do they move differently from big dogs, or does leg length actually make no difference at all? I could watch these dogs all day. It's such a lovely, fluid motion as they zoom across. The reason it looks so fluid it's because dogs don't have a collarbone like humans, fixing their shoulder in place. So their whole shoulder blade moves fluidly up and down across their thorax, making their run look almost effortless. Now, the other thing they have to contend with is four legs. Coordinating those legs so you don't trip up means they have to have a very specific gait. When dogs are walking or trotting, there's always at least one front paw and one back paw on the ground creating a front-back, front-back rhythm. When they start to run, their spine flexes and their back legs swing further forward. And the pattern changes to front-front, back-back. Big or small, nearly all dogs run with this same gait. But there is one dog that does run in a different way the Greyhound. Greyhound racing as we know it today actually began in the Elizabethan era with hare coursing. A sport that saw dogs chase a hare across open ground. The first dog to catch it was the winner. To find out how the sport and the dogs have transformed over the last 400 years, I've come to Sheffield to meet the former owner of this stadium, John Carter. So how did we get from hare coursing to greyhound racing? Now that is the great question. An inanimate hare conveyor <laughs> was patented by a Mr. Owen Patrick Smith in Oklahoma of all places, and that changed the whole of greyhound racing and coursing. It was the lateral thinking Americans who invented the idea of an oval circuit. The people could see the full circle, and it tested the greyhounds then more for their agility as well as their speed. With the arrival of oval track stadiums, professional greyhound racing took off. By 1946, gate attendance reached more than 190 million across Britain. An entire industry was built on this dog's remarkable speed. But why is it so fast? 
Greyhounds are masters of what's called the double suspension gallop. They're airborne twice in every cycle. Their unusually flexible spines allow such a long stride that their back legs overtake their front legs. This powerful gait and long history of being bred for speed has made greyhounds the fastest dogs on the planet. Breeder Elaine Parker is enjoying a proud moment with her dog, who's just won a race. Hello! <laughs> oh my goodness! Well. Hello, you! <laughs> she won! <laughs> she did! I didn't really fancy her tonight, but she's just pulled out all the stuff. <laughs> she's done brilliant! <laughs> So we're all pleased. You train an awful lot of dogs, don't you? I do, yeah. About 80 race dogs and 20 puppies. Oh, my goodness. So I find it absolutely amazing that such a tiny, slender, delicate-looking yeah, yeah. dog yeah. can just this warmth of speed. They're a marvellous animal, a marvellous machine. When you think, from coming out of the trap there up to the first bend, they're reaching up to speeds of nearly 40 miles per hour. It's and I have to say, watching them run is very beautiful. It is, it is. And you're gorgeous, eh? <laughs> I don't think I've ever stroked a champion before. <laughs> <laughs> well, she wouldn't be quite a champion, but she's done the business tonight, that's for sure, yeah? <laughs> right, so we've got Cookie, who's nine months, Nutmeg, who's four and a half, and Tosca, who's five. From Chihuahuas to Great Danes. Wows. And everything in between. Yeah, that's a good gift. This is Poppy. She's a Springer Spaniel. This is Mash. This is Missy. The dogs of Brightwell come in all shapes and sizes. We call her Betty, and she's a pug. Yeah, you're a pug. It's hard to believe that this diverse range of dogs all came from the same ancestor. How did we get from the wolf, a wild predator that could attack humans, to the tame companions that share our homes? Dr. Gregor Larson from Durham University has studied this remarkable transition. You're an evolutionary biologist, I am. which is quite a cool thing to be. It's not bad. And you've been charting this extraordinary journey hmm. from wolf to pet dog, That's to right. the domesticated dog. Let's start with what evidence there is that all our domestic dogs really are related to that one common ancestor. It's the DNA. Okay. It's, it's open and shut. There's right. no question. People have speculated about other wild species, maybe coyotes, maybe wild dogs, so these kinds of things from South Africa. It's all the wolf. It's the gray wolf, done deal. It's quite a leap to go from this very wild, fearsome pack animal to something that will sit on your knee and watch television with you. It's an amazing transition. The general school of thought is that it's at least about 15,000, maybe 16,000 years ago. What we think was happening was that there was a pack of wolves or several packs of wolves that were attracted to human camps, the waste products that we were producing. And these wolves that could take advantage of that human niche were the ones that put themselves on a track toward domestication. But it is still a big leap from an animal that's taking advantage of a few waste products mm. to an animal that we have been able to manipulate and train to serve our own purposes. It is, but it's also a very long time frame. Okay. I mean, the first couple of hundred or thousand years, perhaps, uh, where it was a very kind of romantic dance between the two species. And then very slowly, as they come closer and closer, then humans start deliberately selecting for traits. So maybe the most, most tame ones, or the ones that were the best at warning them when other things were around. And then once you start taking over their reproduction and you start deciding who survives and who doesn't, mm -hmm. rather than the wild deciding that, right. that's when the, the domestication really kicks off. And we become true partners at that stage and everything just goes from there. At first by chance, then by choice, we created the wolf that doesn't bite. And over the next 15,000 years, dogs followed in our footsteps as we moved into new environments. There are clues to this shared journey within their anatomy, especially in their paws. Come 
Give me a paw. Give me a paw. Give me a paw. Give me a paw. Good boy. Kai here is an Alaskan Malamute, so was actually bred to exist in, the, in a very similar situation as the early wolves. So when we look at his foot, he's still got some of those classic wolf features. And the main one being, look at that hair between his toes. That's a fantastic insulator. He's got so much resistance to cold that he can stand on ice for hours and hours during the day without any uh, risk of frostbite, which certainly I couldn't do. But if we think about other aspects of dog's feet, one of the classic things that we'll see are obviously nails. And uh, we've got Hetty here, who's our beagle cross. The anatomy of her front foot is very similar to my hand. She's got four digits at the front here, and she's even got a thumb, which is the dew claw. They use it to grasp hold of things. If you watch your dog with a toy or a bone, quite often you'll see that move. And claws are not only used just for running spikes, because that's what they use on most dogs. They're also in the terrier breeds, these little dogs here, they're very good excavators. And that's why terriers, when you look at their tiny wee feet, they've got enormously strong and very long, powerful claws, because they do use them for digging and making a mess of your garden, no doubt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Dexter is a classic water-loving breed, um, which is uh, the Labrador Retriever, a chocolate lab with big, beautiful feet. And obviously, when you've ever met a lab before, you'll notice they've all got massive feet. And if you look between his toes, you can see that classic web connects all of his toes together. And if you can imagine that under the water, spreading his feet out, using them as paddles, and that's why Whenever you get a water-loving dog, they've got huge feet, like a Newfoundland is another example. So it's almost a bit like palm reading. You can look at the sort of the, the shape and size of the feet, the nails, the pads, how much hair is there, and you can understand where these dogs were bred to live and exist, whether that's in the Arctic, whether that's digging holes in your garden, or even in Oxfordshire swimming pools. Dogs love to make a splash. But what is it that makes some dogs such great swimmers? Local veterinary hydrotherapist Emma Barnard encourages dogs to swim for exercise and recuperation. Although dogs like these don't need much encouragement. It's very interesting seeing a dog like Treacle move in the water. She seems very comfortable yeah, here. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. We tend to find that dogs will happily keep themselves fairly buoyant and afloat just using their front legs, and their back legs tend to be their driving force, so as they go to retrieve a toy, that's when they really engage their back legs. Oh, yes, you can engine. really yeah, see absolutely. that pouncing through the water. Um, and is the tail a useful tool Yeah, for they them use as that well. as a rudder, so for helping them steer and manoeuvre around the water. You can see that they really splay their toes out. Yeah, um, and well, she's using her feet very much is. like paddles, isn't Absolutely. she? Absolutely, yeah. Um, <laughs> but generally the Labradors, the flat coat retrievers, the golden retrievers, the spaniels, they all love water. Particularly yeah. this Particularly one. Do you want to go one. in again? Here are treat. Ready? Go! <laughs> Unlike cats, most dogs love water. And we've selectively bred some dogs to be strong swimmers to help us retrieve game from water. But breeds with squat bodies or long backs often find it difficult to swim. But there's one breed that's a particularly accomplished swimmer and it's not the first one that would come to mind. I've come to Surrey to meet one of the hardest working breeds in history. A strong swimmer, prized for its hunting ability and killer instinct. The Poodle. This one's called Breeze and isn't he lovely? All dressed up for a party. How long has this taken you, Anita? Three to four hours. And mm. he'll stand for that length of time? Well, with wine and coffee breaks, yes. <laughs> But you don't get the coffee, do you? <laughs> no. They're done from the time they're three or four weeks of age, so they get used to it. And, and what's the most difficult part about doing it? I think getting both sides to match. <laughs> 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 
The Poodle is often best known for its distinctive style. But this breed's first role made an even bigger splash. The Poodle was originally a hunting dog, bred to retrieve waterfowl and other game from rivers. And that has shaped the classic Poodle hairstyle. This is a really practical cut as well as a decorative one. With up to 2,000 tassels that can grow to more than a metre, they need regular trims. <laughs> and some serious washing. Hair drying process begins with an hour of vacuuming off as much water as possible. It's too darn hot. It's Next, too three darn hours hot. under the hair dryers. I'd like to sup with my baby tonight. And finally, after 24 hours in a toweling onesie, we have a clean, dry dog. So how did these dogs become so hairy in the first place? And we're very lucky to have Julie and her dogs here. So we've got Daz, we've got Oz, and we've also got Dennis hiding down there. And this is uh, actually a first for me because I've never met a Commodore before. How many are in the country? We reckon about 40, 50 at the most. Yeah, wow, yeah, so pretty rare. And this incredible hair is their characteristic feature. When we see the length of something... <laughs> Look at that! <laughs> this is probably hair he would have shared yeah. if it hadn't tangled. Well, I've actually cut probably that much off. Have you really? Already, as well? Over, over yeah. the few years. But it does serve a purpose. And the reason that they've been bred in this way is thought that it's really fantastic defence against being bitten. Because back in their native Hungary, their job was to defend livestock such as sheep. And if you can imagine a wolf's jaws like this coming in and wallop like this, all I've got here is hair. So it's a fantastic lightweight body armour. But I also think it's probably a bit of camouflage as well. You could imagine a wolf turning up and suddenly one of the sheep rushing at him and barking his head <laughs> off. Oh, hello, I'm sorry, yes, we are still interested in you as well. A fantastic dog. Well, we think so. Yeah. <laughs> I'll bet you do. We're by ourselves, we? <laughs> And next to these Commodores, we've got the other end of the spectrum, a hairless dog. Thanks very much, guys. This is the Chinese Crested, and they look so unusual. <laughs> a little bit grumbly today, are we, madam? <laughs> but they, they are naturally like this. They're born without any hair on their body, so they do have this very unusual look of just the extremes, like the ears, the head, tips of the feet and tips of the tail, and then the rest of the body is this very fine hair, if, if any hair at all. What's really interesting about this breed, though, is that this is one as well. This is a powder puff. Hello, gorgeous. I'll pop you down because you seem to be quite settled there. So some of the Chinese crested in the litter will have hair. You don't know always what you're going to get. You may get some like you, very beautiful, and you may get some like our examples over here that have no hair on their bodies at all. And this skin is remarkable. It's very, very warm. Um, and that's one of the things that people really do notice. Dogs have a higher internal temperature than us, so their skin does naturally feel warmer than ours. We put sun cream on them as well. Yeah, absolutely, on a day um, like today, very they're important. quite high factor. Mm. Now, the origin of the hairless dog may have been just to make them a bit more oven ready because we believe that they were hairless because they were good to pop into the oven, which is a bit of a gruesome well, thing. Well, I've been told that the reason that they had the hairless, them to be hairless, because yeah. they were given to princesses as hot water bottles <laughs> in their day. That's a much nicer story than the one I've and heard. So. They are bed warmers because yeah. mine do actually sleep in the bed and on the bed with me, okay. and they are wonderful. They are the yeah. most beautiful breed to live with. Yeah, thank you very much. From curly hair to smooth, thick to wiry, dog coats vary enormously. And since the dog genome was decoded eight years ago, we found out that just three genes control 95% of this diversity. But it's not just the type of hair. Another three genes also control the underlying color of the coat, including one of the most prized colors, a coat of gold. Oh. 
Every few years, hundreds of golden retrievers from around the world descend on the Gusagan estate in the Scottish Highlands, the ancestral home of this much-loved dog. It was here, in 1865, that Lord Tweedmouth set out to produce a new breed of hunting dog. Now, you may have heard the saying that gentlemen prefer blondes, and I think in Lord Tweedmouth's case, that was true. Lord Tweedmouth wanted a golden-haired retrieving dog, so he set about creating one. He started with a puppy called Naus a yellow puppy from a litter of black retrievers. Then he crossed him with a tweed water spaniel, a breed that's now extinct. Their offspring he crossed with a red setter and again back to the tweed water spaniel. And so it went on until he began to see those golden puppies that he was really after. They didn't start out being called golden retrievers though. They were known as the yellow retriever right up until 1910. The nickname came when a notorious peer said that they all were the same colour as a golden guinea. So, um, now you're definitely too red. You're a bit paler. You're quite golden. I think you must be Goldilocks. Amazingly, every golden retriever in the world is descended from the original dogs of the Gusagan estate. A classic example of the power of selective breeding. Here in the village, we've got dogs of every shade and tone. But how did so many colours emerge? We might find a clue by looking at which of these different coloured puppies people choose. We've got a fantastic litter of gorgeous puppies here, all different colours. So which one would you take home? Which one is your favourite? Yeah, I like this one because um, I've already got a golden dog, so I want a black one. Eileen, faced <laughs> with these guys, which strikes you as the one that you'd take home? I'd go for that one. This one here? Yeah, because it was underneath. <laughs> Oh, well. We won't hold you to it. No, don't do that. One that's sleeping. Snap decision, come on. Snap decision. All right, well, they're all lovely. Mmm. I, I like the colour, and I think it's curious. Very good. It might be that one in the top left corner. This one here? Yeah. I like the colours in its face and back. The dark one here. I think I'd take that one home. Why did you go for that one? Well, the colouring's very appealing. Good, very good. So there was some variation, but we did have a clear winner, and it's this one, the only black one. And I think the most common reason is because he stands out. There's something in the human psychology, I think, that makes us select that one that's a little bit different. And if you take that over many, many generations, you're going to end up with this huge variety of dogs that we see today. Puppies born with unique features are often the ones that catch our eye. And by breeding from such dogs, we've created the eclectic creatures we know and love today. Modern breeds originated in the 19th century when experimenting with selective breeding became something of an art form. Here at the Natural History Museum at Tring is the animal collection of Walter Rothschild, a keen Victorian naturalist, and proudly displayed amongst some of the most exotic specimens on Earth is a case of domestic dogs. These offer a rare snapshot into the Victorian era, the very foundation of the modern dog. This was a time of Darwin, of classification, and a new way of looking at dogs. They were not just working animals. Now they were also being bred to be elegant pets, 
and good companions. Professor Michael Warboys has studied this change of attitude. The dogs here are reflecting the Victorian interest in the actual beauty of the dog. So the dogs in here are being catalogued and classified, but they're also reflecting fashion. Oh, yes. They were almost kind of consumer items, and with that went a whole consumer culture. That's a pointer too, mm. you know. That's supposed to be a pointer, pointer like you. It is. So is it true to say that the Victorians were the fathers of the modern dog show? There were dog shows held mainly in working-class areas, in pubs, but where it really took off was when the dog shows became urban events and the middle classes joined and toy dogs and pet dogs came in. So who was it who brought all this together? It was a man called John Henry Walsh, who was the editor of the weekly newspaper, The Field, which published the results of all the dog shows. And what he wanted to do was to have a standard that judges could refer to and that would work for dog shows across the whole country. So I'm going to ask you now, what was the first dog to be standardised? But I think I've got a clue here. <laughs> yes. OK. As you see here, the first one he published was of a pointer, and he chose a particular dog called Major, who had won the recent show at Birmingham. He calls this a model. The two do still look quite similar, though, don't they? They are very similar. Yeah. Oh, who's that? The Victorians had invented the concept of a standardised breed. Up till now, breeds hadn't existed. Dogs had been defined by the jobs they did. Now, owners strive to produce the perfect pooch. And the dog show became a national institution. The myriad of types of dogs that we know and love today. And indeed, the very idea of breeds is all thanks to the Victorians. And to one man who took the time to write down the shape and size of a pointer named Major. Hello, gorgeous. <laughs> Almost every breed here in Brightwell was defined in the Victorian era. But the Victorians weren't the first to turn dogs from work to play, as Gregor Larson has discovered. We know that for the first 10,000 or more years, dogs did jobs. Yeah. You had a job to do, and a dog did that job, you kept that dog. As soon as that job disappeared, the dog disappeared. And we have lots of examples of that. The first evidence we have for dogs maybe not really doing jobs, but just kind of hanging out, were the Romans. About 2,000 years ago, they had very small dogs. You could make the argument that maybe they were bed dogs, they were keeping the beds warm, but it looks like the fashion thing is kind of kicking in a little bit. But really, 150 years ago with the Victorians really hits its stride. Right. And now that has accelerated to the point now where virtually all dogs in the UK are just for companionship. We have completely gone 180 degrees away from the whole point of dog domestication, which was to do stuff. So dogs, the breeding of dogs, has gone from, you know, picking a trait that would mean a dog was good to go down a hole or flush prey or point out prey mm -hmm. to something that can lie around on a velvet cushion looking gorgeous. Looking gorgeous, which they do very well. <laughs> Uh, 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 that's enough. This is Ewok, and he's a four-year-old Australian Labradoodle. This is Hector. He's a miniature schnauzer. He's an Alaskan Malamute. Nine-month-old Harlequin Great Day. I love all dogs, but I like something a little bit different. Selective breeding is a powerful tool in any animal. But our long history of intentionally selecting extreme features in dogs has led to some extraordinary changes. <laughs> we can see just how much they vary by looking under their skin at their skulls. So we've got a fantastic array of skulls from different breeds. And you can see that uh, when we look at where they all started, which is our wolf. And if I show you in comparison a Labrador, one of the most remarkable things is how similar they are. Strip away the flesh and get down to the bare bones. What we've got is basically a small wolf. This ancestral wolf-like appearance that's still visible in some breeds has been radically changed in many others. 
So if we look at our collie here, we've been able to selectively elongate the nose for our fast running breeds who are catching small agile prey. So dogs like collies, greyhounds, those sorts of long noses. But we can also shorten the noses and we've had some dramatic shortening of some faces. This is the Pekingese here and when you see there's hardly any nose there at all. It's tipped up, it's compressed and it's cramped all of those teeth in there. Why would you do that? Well, one reason is, is like this chihuahua skull here. It's got that flat and short nose. Obviously, it doesn't look that cute when it's just the skeleton, but here we go. Let, I'll show you nutmeg. The, you can understand why people have selectively bred for these very cute, big eyes, short little sort of nose. Looks very like a human baby. You're very, very gorgeous, aren't you, Nutmeg? Thank you very much. But it's not just short noses in cute dogs. One of the classic ones is this one. Doesn't that look monstrous? It's the bulldog. Sometimes the extreme ways we've changed the shape of our dogs ends up causing problems. And nothing illustrates this more than the story of the bulldog. London South Bank to find out how that most British of breeds, the Bulldog, got its name. The story starts back in Elizabethan times when here in the back streets of Southwark, large raucous crowds gathered hungry for entertainment. And I'm not talking Shakespeare. Julian, you're an archaeologist with the Museum of London Archaeology and you've made a study of, of this area. How do dogs like Coco fit in? Well, happily for Coco, she doesn't. She's <laughs> alive and well today. I don't think she would have liked being here 400 years ago. This area of the South Bank was the traditional place for animal baiting. They baited bears, they baited bulls. So they, they're rings and you put a bull in and then you yeah. send him one dog, two dogs? Oh, you send three or four. Are there any contemporary accounts of what it was like to actually be at the bull baiting? There's a very good one by John Evelyn, the famous diarist that you might like from um, the 16th of June, 1670. <laughs> oh my goodness. One of the bulls tossed a dog full into a lady's lap as she sat in one of the boxes at a considerable height from the arena. So it must have been extremely violent. It was very bloody, not only in the arena, but the poor lady sitting up in the boxes who gets a dog carcass on her. It's hard to really see that as entertainment these it, days, it is, isn't it? But yes, it was a very popular afternoon out. So it was dogs like Coco, then, who were baiting these bulls? Well, not really. Today's bulldogs are, are really rather a different breed. Our excavations have uncovered the kind of dogs they had, and they're very, very different. It's a very typical Elizabethan Mastiff. It's a very big, powerful brute that's actually about twice the size as Coco. It is completely different, isn't it? I mean, particularly the snout here. I mean, a modern bulldog <laughs> has a much, much shorter muzzle. It's completely muzzle. different, yes. So this is a real Elizabethan bulldog skull. What do you think, Coco? This is one of your ancestors, look. <laughs> She's not interested in family history, I don't think. <laughs> In the Elizabethan era, a bulldog was any kind of dog used to fight bulls. It wasn't until the Victorians that a single breeding line was defined, and the bulldog became a show dog. Over the next 150 years, we exaggerated its defining features by selective breeding. The nose was made shorter, the jaws wider, and the back of the body smaller. The bulldog turned into a caricature of itself. In time, the bulldog became a real symbol of the British fighting spirit. And in World War II, it became synonymous with Winston Churchill, which is ironic, really, because Winston never owned a bulldog. He had a poodle called Rufus. Over the years, the changes in the bulldog's shape have had unfortunate consequences. Sit, sit. Good boy. The flatter nose and shorter legs have caused health problems, something bulldog breeder Derek Mollett is working to correct. 
So here we have Lily, who's our classic standard bulldog. And next to her, we've got Bosun. Quite clearly looks like a bulldog, but very, very different. So Derek, explain to me, what is Bosun? Bosun is a mullet bulldog. It's something that my late brother started. He had a, a kennel club bulldog, mm -hmm. which unfortunately died at a very young age. Okay. So he wanted to bring the bulldog back to what it used to be, a healthier animal. What sort of traits have you been trying to breed back into the bulldog? Well, we wanted uh, more length in the leg yeah. and also a little longer muzzle. Yes. Lily, as you can hear, yes. has got that classic narrowing of her airways, which comes along with this concertinaed face. And, you know, this noise that she's making, she's really struggled with the heat today. Exactly. Whereas he is, you know, he's panted like a normal dog. He doesn't make any excessive noise and he's no. been able to sort of cope with the Exactly, conditions. exactly. So how did you go about changing from this to this? Well, obviously, we had to use other blood. Yeah. And we've used the bull mastiff okay. and the staff. Right, yeah. And, uh, you know, this is the result. So you're breeding again like they did originally, the breeding for performance. Like a good, healthy family pet that can be yeah. taken for a nice long walk and not have to be carried home. What's striking to me is that he is starting to look a lot more like the bulldogs that we saw back in those Victorian paintings. Exactly. Yeah, it's a bit of living history. It's lovely to see. It is. Thank you. The power of crossbreeding to make a dog like Boson healthier is clear. Mixed breeds are becoming increasingly popular. But a dog's ancestry may not always be what it first appears. Each breed has a telltale genetic signature. So to reveal the true family history of some of the village dogs, we asked canine geneticist Dr. Neil Fretwell to carry out DNA tests. Well, let's start with you, Anna. Tell me a little bit about your dog. We got Charlie when uh, she was a four-month-old puppy from a dog rescue centre in Stoke and Church. Mm -hmm. And the paperwork said she was a Jack Russell cross. Well, Neil, what did you discover when you analysed her DNA? They were definitely right about the parents. So there was a purebred parent that was a rat terrier, very right. closely related breed to the Jack Russell terrier. However, on the other side oh. of the family tree was um, a grandparent that was a German Shepherd. What? And I think you can see the saddleback a little bit here with the, the black coloration. Right. Um, which is just coming through, but it's much more diluted than the normal German yeah. Shepherd. But also the ears, of course, are characteristic. But you're getting the size from the Russell Terrier, obviously taking that down to uh, the medium-sized dog you're seeing there. Wow. Are you surprised? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> re really. Um... But if we now go to this dog, who's this? This is Bertie. Hi, Bertie. Um, now, what do you think Bertie is? He's a cockapoo. He's a cockapoo. First generation. You're, so a first generation cockapoo is a mixture between a poodle and a cocker spaniel? Yes, exactly. OK. And that's what you bought? That's what we bought, yes. Did he? So when we tested Bertie, what we found was definitely first generation parent poodle. Yeah. But on the other side of the family tree, we found an English Springer Spaniel, not a Cocker Spaniel. So not a Cockapoo at all, in fact, but a Springer Poo. Is there such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an unusual name, but yes, it's not something we were aware of. So the only hint of the Springer Spaniel is in the, the chest of Bertie. You can see a little white chest flash. Yeah. yeah. That's obviously consistent with the English Springer Spaniel. Oh, right, I see, right, OK. Yeah. He's a very good-natured dog, so as regards to the dog, no yeah. complaints, thank you. Now we come to my two, both rescue dogs, both most definitely mongrels. Let's start with Bella. Belle, come here. Let's go. Now, this little dog. We think that she is almost certainly border, maybe with something like a Lakeland. Well, we, one of the parents was a purebred, the, the purebred Parson Russell on one side. Right. The other side was a Border Terrier cross. Was a Border Terrier cross. There's a little bit of Australian Shepherd way back at the great-grandparent level as well, but really? you're not seeing that. <laughs> so, actually, although she hasn't shown any sign of being a brilliant sheepdog yet, that might be a latent ability that she has. Potentially. <gasps> Belle, we're going to have to practice on the sheep at home. Right, now let's get to my little boy. Now, Badger is a complete mystery. Some people think that he must have Collie in him. My neighbour, uh, a vet, thinks he's Parsons Jack Russell crossed with Lurcher. Um, can you reveal his true roots? Certainly, yes. Yeah. So Badger actually had a parent that was a Russell Terrier again. Right. So we've got Jack Russell. Some of the guesses were right there. Yeah. But also on the other side of the family tree, we found a grandparent that was a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. No way. Badge, you're royalty. <laughs> 
I'm a bit disappointed. I thought he was a proper kind of working class, none of this sort of namby-pamby royalty. The long hair, you've got to come from somewhere. And yes. so, obviously, that's quite consistent with having a long-coated Russell Terry on one side of the yeah. tree and then the long hair from the Cavalier on the other side. But he is... He, there's a lot of mixed breed on, on his bit, isn't On it? that side with the Cavalier, definitely. Badge, I think we just have to accept that you're 100% proper mongrel, and I'm delighted by that. Neil, thank you very, very much indeed. It's a delight. As we've bred and crossbred our dogs, we've dramatically altered their appearance. But what about their underlying genetics? Is there any hint of wolf still left in modern dogs? We've heard a lot about genes being responsible for particular traits or looks in dogs. Has the DNA of the wolf changed now almost beyond recognition with our modern dogs? We now have a, n a very, very few handful of traits of very powerful genes that are controlling most of that ridiculous diversity that we see. So there's lots of places where it's pretty pretty much the same. You wouldn't really even tell the difference between a dog and a wolf. Right. But there are certain genes that we have selected for size, for example, for coat colors, that are radically different than anything that you see in the wild. And Why are some dogs so much bigger than others? <laughs> What's really obvious watching these dogs racing back and forth is the sheer variety in size. And that's not surprising because domestic dogs display the biggest size range of any terrestrial mammal, living or extinct. Dogs vary from 10 centimetres high to more than a metre. In human terms, that's the equivalent of having a person a metre tall alongside a 10 metre giant. I'd like you to meet Boris here, who is one of the extreme ends of the dogs in the village in terms of size. Look at him, he's enormous. He's a mastiff. And to give you a sense of the other end of the scale, I'm going to show you Dudley. Now, these two know each other. In fact, they are friends. They met at the local vet surgery, and the receptionist there thought it was so bizarre that they played together. She took a photo, and actually it made it onto the front of the local paper. I've got Boris's owner, Chris, here. Hello. Now, what made you pick Boris? I take it you thought long and hard about letting a dinosaur into your house. <laughs> all known love with all this dazzling diversity. To find out, we're putting these dogs through their paces. We'll investigate how the breeds compare and reveal what makes each one unique. We'll find out what makes the Greyhound the fastest breed of all. From coming out of the trap up to the first bend, they're reaching nearly 40 miles per hour. Reveal what makes these dogs such good swimmers. Oh, yes, you can really see that pulsing through the water. Uncover why some dogs are so hairy and others hairless. The origin of the hairless dog may have been just to make them a bit more oven ready. And historian Ruth Goodman will unearth the extraordinary stories behind some of the world's most iconic breeds. This is one of your ancestors, look. She's not interested in family history, I don't think. We're celebrating the dog in all its spectacular and unlikely forms. Welcome to the wonder of dogs. Well, we've had Mastiffs before, so we kind of knew what we were in for. And um, apart from the fact that he takes up a whole settee to himself in the evening when we sit down and watch the telly, um, it's just like having any other dog, really, just bigger. But, Helen, you wanted something very different. What made you pick Dudley? Because he is absolutely tiny. Uh, we sat for a neighbour's puppy, to our puppy, and they're just such huge characters that we decided to get one. 
Well, hopefully we can get some lovely photos taken. I think the most incredible aspect of both of these dogs is they are, believe it or not, the same species. If you want to see how that is possible, you have to get it under the skin and take a look at the bones, which we have over here. Now, this is a chihuahua skeleton. And look how tiny that is, especially when you put it next to a bigger dog. Now, unfortunately, this isn't a massive, this is a greyhound. And if you look at them, they do look wildly different. But when you focus in on the bones, there aren't any more in the greyhound. They're just a different size and shape, resulting in two completely different looking animals. All dogs have 301 bones in their bodies. It's just the additional number of tail bones that varies. Now, archaeologists have found bones of big and small dogs in ancient human settlements, highlighting the fact that we've been living with dogs of varying sizes. Here in Brightwell, in Oxfordshire, we're carrying out a unique investigation into man's best friend. We've invited all the local dogs. We've got Labradors, Labradoodles, Pugs, Chihuahuas, Mastiffs, Collies, Spaniels, plus some very special guests, like this wonderful Commodore behind me. And down here, I've got my three very excited dogs. This is Teg and Badger and Bella. In our big marquee over there, we're conducting a census of the village dogs recording their every feature, from the pads on their paws to the colour of their coats. In our anatomy tent, we're going to explore that ingenious physiology hidden under all that fur. And in here, we're delving into doggy DNA. We want to find out if there's something unique inside every domestic dog that allows them to come in so many shapes and sizes and to reveal the surprising pedigrees of some of Brightwell's dogs. Throughout the show, we'll be uncovering how such extreme differences between dogs came about. Our first question, what... Across hundreds and thousands of years. And this is reflected well in the village today, from 100 kilos of Boris at one end, all the way down to Dudley here, who weighs less than a kilo. Now, you may think that the Chihuahua is a recent invention, bred purely for fashion, but they've got a surprisingly long and intriguing history. Ruth Goodman is at the British Museum to uncover the big story behind the world's smallest breed. As an historian and a dog lover, I've always been fascinated by the way that people and dogs seem to have evolved together. In fact, if you start looking at that relationship throughout history, what you're really studying is us. I've come to see how Rhea, as a chihuahua, is absolutely a perfect example of this relationship. Scientists have found a DNA connection between modern chihuahuas and ancient Mexican dogs that lived a thousand years ago. Dr. Elizabeth Bacadano has seen these small dogs depicted by several lost civilizations. Dogs were really essential companions of the Mexicans. The Aztecs represented them, the Toltecs, the Mayas, the Mistecs. This lady, she's got a little tiny dog holding it, just like 